our private educational institutions cling firmly to bizarre rituals, whose meaning may now be lost even to the participants. Westminster School observes Shrove Tuesday with the ceremony of the Grease. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the Grease of 1979 is Stephen Squire. Westminster School has been tucked away behind the Abbey for more than four centuries. Today, it's an expensive and selective English public school, surviving in the heart of London just a stone's throw from the House of Commons, where some members would still dearly love to abolish it. There are 550 pupils, and the basic fees range between £1,700 and £2,700. Old boys include six prime ministers, 14 archbishops, Sir Christopher Wren, Ben Johnson, John Dryden, Tony Benn, and the spy Kim... Christopher Potter is the 13-year-old son of a company secretary and is one of the 40 Queen's scholars who've won half-price fees at an annual exam called The Challenge. Good morning, Duffle. Do you want the curtains drawn? It's not really worth it now, is it, you idiot? The scholars all live together in the school's oldest house, college. I'm in my first year here at Westminster and at the moment I share a dormitory with seven other people in my year. There's not a lot of privacy. But when you get into the second, third and fourth years, you have a study of your own and you can be as free as you like to be. Hello, do you want something else? No, thanks. Right. Westminster doesn't have bells. Instead, there are calls known as lilting, one of the only forms of fagging still left. Jim Cogan is a rather informal housemaster, but that doesn't mean to say he's in any way slack. Where were you last night, the Titters and Duffel? We went to the Tizard actually, we went to get some supper afterwards. Then why didn't you sign out? Well, because I had no idea where you were. That goes for you too, Oliver. Yeah. What? Well, how many you? I don't give a damn where the hell knew. I mean, what's the good set? I was wandering around here looking for you people. Porter Duffel stuffing himself down Victoria Street is no <laughs> consolation as far as I'm concerned. Precedent. Jury, Petistus, Nansen, Levy, King, Duffel, Patterson, Bird, Wedgwood, Bostrich, Rood, Berman, Insel, Potter, Guppy. Oh, God! Well, Mr. They've abolished corporal punishment. We're running around green because uh, we'd been involved in a pillow fight last night. I feel really guilty about people like Barry who sort of walk through a lot. Keel over for good. Daisy Goodwin, aged 17, and her younger brother Jason are the children of a successful film producer. Like all public schools, Westminster faces radical changes. One of the most radical was admitting girls in 1972. There are just over 50 in the sixth form only, 
but they may be the thin end of a wedge. Nearly half the school are now day pupils, like Daisy. I've already taken one A-level, Russian, and this year I'm taking English, History and Greek. At the same time, Jason's taking his O-levels. We're both in the same day house, Ash Burnham, and our house master is Alan Livingston Smith, but we all called him Scar. Ah! Oh, because, you see, my, my father, I left late, you see, so yeah. I told my father he'd, he'd ring, you see, hmm. and so I thought he'd run. No, he didn't. Well, why didn't you come and ask me about it? Just Roy, you're cracking up, boy. Now, I've got to work hard to keep you out of Saturday evening jankers, OK? OK, off you go. Yes. Right, OK, thank you. Oh. Simon. Simon is developing a cold, aren't we all? Hello, swimming, OK. Oh, your mother's getting soft in her old age. Okay. Jason, come in. Yep. Right then, let's have a look. Oh. Uh, physics, 8 April 22. Come in. Yes. And if you're a girl, the temptation is to be all flirty and silly and giggly. Um, the only way you can retain your self-respect is to do very well academically. And so the boys were slightly confused because I was so terribly silly and, and giggly and thoroughly obnoxious. But yet I do quite well academically. And I really wanted to do well just to show them that I wasn't just a sort of dumb brunette. Have you got your stuff ready for Jim? Can I borrow your German friend? Oh, please. Has he... Well, he won't have got it right. Um, would you just like to give me a note of your housekeeper's name in case I've got to phone her up and say that Aeneas has broken his leg or something like that? There you are. Spanish or Portuguese? Spanish. Well, I'll try my faltering Spanish on her if necessary. I'm sure. Yeah. Bye-bye. Right, now then. Uh, these A-levels, um, we are thinking in terms of English, French, French, French <coughs> German, history. I mean, the thing that really worries me is just the physical. Well, <coughs> my answer to that is there's no good prejudging the physical thing. Let's see how it works out. Yeah. And if you've got to, to drop one, you've got to drop one, you know. Yeah. Ash Burnham. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Come on, David, hurry up. Dump your things, come on. Have you both? Come on, last minute panic as usual. Oh, sir, is the, is the what? Is the notice from Nathan? No, we don't have a notice. Find elsewhere. Get into Abbey first. If you're going to die, it's a good place to die, right? The close links with Westminster Abbey give morning assembly an unusual grandeur. The headmaster, Dr John Ray, is known to be a radical educationalist, though that quality is not immediately clear to small boys like Potter. Well, the headmaster is very distant as far as it goes. He isn't very close to me at the moment. I mean, he doesn't teach me. He isn't close to me in my house. He isn't remotely where I can talk to him on the same level. If I was talking to him, I'd have to peer up into the distant peaks of mountains to see him. You sit down.
Simon Tarje is a scholar and a house monitor in college. He's 17 and one of three brothers who all went to Westminster. His mother's an artist, his father a civil servant. Simon's just taken mock A-levels in the unusual combination of English, maths, chemistry and physics. Archaic apparatus, <laughs> any minute's going to fall to bits or something. Oh, look, in there you've got some air trapped in a glass bowl. Yeah. What's the, what, what, can you see what's wrong with it? Do you know how much air you've got? Uh, yeah, but I mean, I mean, I didn't really think it was crucial to have the water right up to the top. I mean, well, why not? Because the water's going to expand, isn't it? And therefore you're heating a different volume of the air on each reading. You must cover that. Good point, good point. Smart. Right, well, look, um, I mean, they're very nice results. We're getting a nice linear relationship there. Well, you will with two points, won't you? What I suggest you do is cover it, note the thing at this temperature, and just, just go on from here. The teaching here is very specialised. They all know their jobs. They're all very good, actually. And they're all a little egocentric about their subjects, to some extent. Um, the trouble is that um, if you get a man who, who really is good in his subject, he becomes so specialised that he doesn't sort of admit so much of the other side of the coin. And I find, personally, that's a difficulty about my combination of subjects, is that um, you go into their class and they want you to be totally absorbed in their subject and their subject alone. Quite rightly, too. That, that's what a, a, a real um, expert in a field is. And that means it's very difficult to combine the two. Now, if you're doing maths, physics and chemistry, you can combine them because they all overlap at the edges. And you're always ticking over in the same direction. It's the same sort of thought process. If I'm doing English, you have to completely reverse. You have to stop in your tracks, turn around and go off in another direction. And that is, that's the problem I've found, um, that to study the subjects well, it's not just good enough to turn up to the classes. You've got to go along, you've got to take, the, take it away with you at the end of the class, you've got to read up the books in your spare time. Now that's when the trouble starts, they interfere, the two thought processes interfere, and uh, that's a pretty long-winded excuse for the fact that I'm doing rather badly at the moment. At the same time, and this is Eve's point, when we get to the predominantly morbid and sterile context, we get flashbacks yeah, uh, to the... To the vulgar. The yeah, details of their life, when, when he says Frost had given their names to Diamond Edge, the diamonds are reference to their... To their, their lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. absolutely. Uh, and he keeps... Uh, the graveyard's there, and he keeps sort of flashing aspects of their life, details of their character, um, against the background yeah. of, of the yeah. death. So it sort of lives on afterwards. That's precisely it. Yeah. Now, let's concentrate on those first three lines. Your nurse could only speak Italian, but after 20 minutes, I could imagine your final week and tears ran down my cheeks. Now, at that point, notice the aposiopesis, Sinclair. Look. Don't look so horrified, Nicola. It's not aposiopesis. Aposiopesis means yeah. fading away into silence. Dot, 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 at the end of three lines. So oh, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you look it up. Nothing better to do than fuss about spelling. What does the aposiopesis indicate? Well, well, breaking down into Yes, absolutely. Too much breakdown. Come on. Syntactical breakdown suggests emotional breakdown. And we think, my lord, what is the poem going to be? It's going to be a soupy bath of sentiment from this point onwards. Right, here we go. Upstanding. You know the rules. You know the rules. When you get one wrong, down you go. No quarter of the Rory Stewart, teaching the first year, is head of English. He's 39, and apart from brief spells abroad, has always taught in public schools. Right, here we go. Word number one. U-N-C-O-N-S-C-I-O-U-S-L-Y. The clue there is the Latin word scio, S-C. Very good to know. Number six. D-E-F. I-N-I-T-E-L-Y. T-E? Yes, of course. Remember the word finite. That's it. For, if you remember the word finite, you'll get it right. Number eight. Hypocrisy. H-Y-P-O-C-R-I-S-Y. -S Bit of a subsidence there. Why do you choose to teach in a public school rather than in the state sector? Uh, partly because it's a system I know, having been educated in a, in a private school, um, and not feeling a, a crusading need to go out and spread what talents I have elsewhere. Partly because I enormously enjoy teaching in a boarding school. 
and that one can't readily find in the state system. Anybody for the gamble? Um, yes, yes. up on your chair, Carl. You learnt from last time. You learnt from last time. If you get a mistake, remember, you're on the floor. Springe, you're being daring. Now, this is the test. A, double C. O, double M. O, D, A, T, I, O, M. Ring eight. Down you go. Are you perhaps frightened of the idea of teaching in a comprehensive? In a way, I think that's, that, might, that might be fair. Um, probably lazy, I think, as well. Possibly frightened. Lazy about adjusting to the kind of demands that would be made on me there. And I'm not sure that I could do the, the kind of job that I think I do best in that kind of environment. Now, Volponi comes forward. And interestingly, do you notice one of the...